Good morning. I'm Councilman Mark Joan. I chair of the Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our hearing. Our hearing today focuses on safety issues facing small businesses and how we can best protect our mom and pop shops. Small businesses are an integral part of the economy and culture of New York City. According to SBS, approximately 90% of the 220,000 businesses in New York City employ fewer than 20 individuals. Micro businesses, which I'm proud to have sponsored that bill that recognizes micro businesses, mom and pop shops, with nine employees or fewer, capture the more common conception of the mom and pop shop, invoking images of locally owned retail operations like barbershops, pizzerias, and local bodegas. Bodegas are part of our lifeblood of New York City. These corner stores are not just businesses but are part of the character and family of every New York City neighborhood. It is common knowledge that your local bodega will give you more than just morning cup of coffee or a late, ne late night snack. Bodegas commonly sign off on city residence packages, loan out items until they can pay for it later, and serve as a waiting area for kids after school until their parents get off from work. Immigrant New Yorkers have historically owned these institutions. According to a survey released by the Bodega Association of the United States in 2016, over 90% of bodegas are owned by first or second generation immigrants. Nearly 90% of these immigrant New Yorkers saw the bodega industry as a way they could work hard and achieve the American dream. And yet, the city has failed to protect these bodegas. Unlike major, unlike major box stores, small businesses are at an increased risk for crime as they have fewer financial resources to fund a strong security system. Bodegas, often open 24-7, often attended by a single employee, are typical cash businesses and therefore extremely vulnerable to crimes. According to Jose Fernandez, a bodega owner and former president of Bodega Association of the United States, the number one problem for bodega owners is still safety. On June 20th, 2018, 15-year-old Lazijandro Junior Guzman Files was walking alone in the Belmont section of the Bronx when members of the Trinitasios gang mistook him for a rival gang member. After hunting Junior down to a bodega where he was hiding, actually seeking shelter, these gang members dragged him out and murdered him. In response to this vicious gang murder, bodegas fought for the city to provide them with resources to defend, them, to defend themselves against future crimes. I'm proud of my bill, Intro 1623, which will reimburse certain small businesses like bodegas if they purchase a panic button. A majority of the council members have signed on to this bill, more than 30 have co-signed or sponsored this bill, which will be vital in providing bodegas with a free security service. After the council receives a detailed assessment of the program, we will look no further to legislate to protect our bodegas. While nearly 90% of the bodega owners brought their store as a way to achieve prosperity, over 80% of the bodega owners no longer believe New York City is the best city in America for an immigrant to start a small business and achieve the American dream. As chair of the Small Business Committee, I find that unacceptable and so should you. The city must do more to serve as a resource to our small businesses and bodegas. No owner of a small business or bodega in the city should fear for their life going to work. My bill is a strong step toward making these businesses safer so they can continue to be the bedrock of our communities. I'd like to take a moment to thank my entire legislative team. Irene Bohosky, former Small Business Council who crafted this bill. Stephanie Jones, my current Small Business Council. Noah Megsler, the legislative policy and the analyst. My chief of staff, Reggie Johnson, and legislative budget coordinator, Stephanie Oris. Finally, I'd like to recognize, or as they appear, my colleagues who have joined us today. I want to thank you all for being here on this very important hearing.
Good morning, Chair Joni and members. I'm sorry. Can we spare you in? Raise your hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly and fully to the council members' questions? Yes. yes. Good morning, Chair Joni and members of the council. I am Deputy Inspector Jessica Corey, the commanding officer of the New York City Police Department's Community Affairs Bureau Crime Prevention Division. In addition to my colleagues from the Department of Small Business Services, I am joined here today by Michael Clark, the Managing Attorney of the NYPD's Legislative Affairs Unit. On behalf of Police Commissioner James P. O'Neill, I would like to thank the Council for the opportunity to speak about the Department's efforts to help small businesses and bodegas provide a safe environment for their workers and patrons and to comment on the bill being heard today. Our business community is the lifeblood of the city's economy. These small, frequently family-owned businesses are an integral part of every neighborhood in the city, and throughout the city's history, they have represented a path to upward mobility for many of the immigrant communities that make up the fabric of New York. Bodegas are more than a place where you grab a sandwich. They are coffee shops, quasi-community centers, places to hear the latest neighborhood goings-on and most importantly, places to buy day-to-day -day products everybody needs when the nearest grocery is store is often many blocks or subway stops away. Opening one of the, operating one of these businesses presents a unique set of security challenges. Many are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and may have only one or two employees working at a time, and may be the only business around for blocks. Because of the ubiquity of these stores and the uniformity of their security concerns throughout the city, much of the focus of the Crime Prevention Division has been outreach, coordination, and information sharing with these businesses. The innovation of neighborhood policing has allowed the department to more effectively collaborate with small business owners and workers by building trust and developing relationships. We see every day that the rela relationships our neighborhood coordination officers sector cops and crime prevention officers develop are integral to solving and preventing crimes, both at these businesses and neighborhoods throughout the city. The NYPD offers small business, the small business community um, help to help better secure their establishments against robberies, burglaries, shopliftings, fraud, and vandalism. To start, the Crime Prevention Division and Precinct Crime Prevention Officers offer these businesses information and assistance so they can better protect their establishments. Crime prevention officers will conduct a free security survey of any location when requested in order to harden their physical security. They inspect and analyze a location for security deficiencies such as missing or insufficient lighting, lack of height markers on the doors, and unsecured high-priced items, as well as many others, and I skipped over video surveillance equipment and obstructed sight lines. Uh, they, will take, they will then take the store owner through the step-by-step -step breakdown of these deficiencies and offer recommendations on best practices to correct the problems and the types of equipment that, are, that offer the best protection. The department has consistently worked to inform the small business, business owners of resources available to them, but the senseless and tragic murder of Junior Guzman Feliz has rightly brought the risks faced by these valu valuable community institutions to the forefront. The department routinely holds meetings and information sharing sessions with businesses of all kinds. Last year, I participated in a conference in the Bronx with leaders and members of the United Bodegas of America, where I spoke with dozens of bodega owners about common security issues we see in bodegas, the steps they can take to prevent crime in their stores, and the resources the department provides them to do so. Meetings like this are invaluable into getting the word out about the options available to these businesses, business owners, and I look forward to participating in more of these events in the future. I also encourage business owners that have not yet taken advantage of our free security survey service to do so by contacting their local precinct. I would now like to speak about the bill under consideration today. Intro 1623 would require SBS to create a panic button pilot program. 
While we support store owners installing comprehensive security systems, the department is not able to receive a direct notification from a panic button. Even if the technology could accommodate such an alert, it is not advisable. Panic buttons of any kind are not the ideal method to alert the police and have become far less necessary with the prevalence of mobile phones, but they can be useful as part of a comprehensive security system. Unfortunately, at times, a panic button may be the only option, but calling 911 allows the call taker to gather information so that the officers know what they are walking into, which is safer for everyone involved. Any panic button should be part of an integrated security system which is installed, maintained, and monitored by a third-party central station alarm monitoring company. That is what we recommend to store owners when we meet with them and w or when we conduct the security survey, as I mentioned. The systems typically comply with the current industry standards and certification requirements under the relevant industry regulatory bodies and are regularly checked remotely for hardware and software lapses, as well as battery functionality. Additionally, under no circumstances should a panic button create an audible sound. If a person with a weapon is alerted that a panic button has been pressed, that will heighten the danger for anyone who is present before trained police officers can arrive and address the situation. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about this critical issue, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Deputy Inspector. You're familiar with the tragedy of Junior. Yes, sir. The employee at that moment was trying to protect juniors later on revealed through the footages that we've seen. Mm -hmm. He had no free hand or an opportunity to dial 911. He was actually trying to protect Junior from that gang that was hunting him down. Mm -hmm. If a panic button did exist while the struggle was going on and law enforcement was notified, just possible, law enforcement could have arrived and prevented that tragedy. So in the comment you made about not knowing what, and I have the utmost respect mm -hmm. for confidence, and I often say it's hard to find the words to thank any man and woman that puts on that uniform risk their own lives, that runs toward danger when everyone else runs away. You're the highest trained law enforcement agency in the country, in the world perhaps. And I understand walking into a scene and not knowing what you're walking into, but that's what you're trained for. And if that panic button existed, Junior may still be with us today. So having he hearing you say that you're concerned about this type of a system that would notify law enforcement of an incident, an audio or an audible sound that would have let those gang members know that there was an alert that was being sent, that the neighborhood was aware that something was going on, I'm not sure I'm understanding why you wouldn't agree that this may not be the only tool in the kit that we should be using, mm -hmm. but certainly one that we should be considering and giving strong considerations to based on just that horrible incident. So, of course, we're not saying that panic alarms should not be used, and we are saying that they should be part of a comprehensive security program, and that would include many things, uh, not just the panic alarm itself, but also uh, having the ability to maybe press a button and secure the door, uh, having cameras, having an alarm system where if you do press the panic button and it does go to a central station, that perhaps you have cameras for video verification that now when they get that alarm, 
they can see what's going on in the store, call the police and say exactly what's going on and how important it is that somebody gets there right away, that there's a person with a gun or a knife or something of, of that nature. So uh, we do think it's important, but as part of a very comprehensive plan. I agree. I'd love to expand this program to include uh, video cameras and self-locking doors and other mechanisms that could help um, prevent tragedies and theft or uh, the risk of someone's life. I agree with you. But this is a pilot program, and the reason we do pilots is to see how um, useful it is, how embraced it is, and then try to shape it and strive to make things bigger and better. But speaking against this, knowing how valuable of a resource it could be, is I don't think in the best interest of anyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying we don't uh, that we oppose the bill. That was not the intent of that paragraph. It was just to lay out the sort of the universe of things that should be considered when doing any security for for any business, any you know place of worship or home. So it's not that we oppose the bill. We we understand the intent of the bill and we support your intent. We we understand that. You know, at the core, you're trying to protect small businesses, and which is what we're trying to do too. And um, their customers, and, and their the customers, public, right. and the, and the neighborhood, and everyone involved. So, you know, I think we're on the same page on the goals of the bill. Um, we're just trying to point out what we recommend to businesses is not just the panic button. Um, it's more comprehensive than that. And uh, in terms of panic buttons, it's not that. You know, we we go there, and, and Inspector Corey's people go, and they say. You should install this as part of this holistic security package, but it doesn't go directly to us. Is another point we're making that it, the way it works today, when people install panic buttons, it goes to a third party, mm -hmm. who then calls the the NYPD. Um, and this is all just factors considerations we're pointing out, rather than saying we're not we don't support the bill. It's it's more sort of a holistic look at it. I want to thank you for that explanation. And just out of curiosity, when, and I'm sure there's countless alarms that go off after hours for businesses or on homes that have such a service where a third party will notify NYPD that alarm has gone off, whether it be for a window, a door opening, or smoke, or what. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to those calls, whether it be a store that has a gate closed or a home that uh, the lights are off on? How do you respond? How does the NYPD so if that central station al alarm company calls the department, notifies the department of that alarm, the response will, uh, officers will respond. So the alarm will come over uh, the central, our central will notify us that there's an alarm and officers will respond to investigate that alarm. And obviously proceed with caution, not knowing if it's a false alarm or if there's actually something going on behind the closed doors. Correct, and the majority of the alarms are false alarms. The mar majority. Majority, but then there's that few where there's actually some criminal activity or something that warranted uh, that alarm to be triggered and you're involved in. Absolutely. Right. Um, so why should this be any different? Meaning that when we look at the positive effect that this could have, notifying you until mm -hmm. someone's able to make that phone call or the audible part of it where a resident or a neighbor walking by or hearing the alarm realizes there's something going on and picks up the phone and says, hey, I'm peeking through a window here. I see an altercation going on. Um, isn't that what we want? So I, I think, again, we're not saying that we don't think you should have the alarm. We're saying it should just be part of a comprehensive package. It should be installed by a licensed alarm installer where the alarm should go to, which would be the, the third party central station, that uh, panic holdup alarms are designed that if you have a holdup alarm, it's specifically not supposed to ring because we don't want to alert somebody and have somebody get hurt or killed because they are upset because somebody pushed an alarm. And when we do talk to people about actually utilizing alarms, uh, if they're using a panic or hold up alarm, we tell them to only do so when they feel it's safe to do so. That pushing the button isn't going to anger somebody or, or, or have create a, a worse incident. Um, but audible alarms are okay for burglar alarms, for instance, because that's not when somebody's actually pushing an alarm. I couldn't agree with you more, but isn't it a deterrent also if perhaps our criminals or those that have ill intent 
uh, realize that bodegas or gas stations or these small businesses are now armed with a panic button that they would think twice before going into a small business with ill intentions or looking to cause harm to someone that's in a small business. So there was a lot of media coverage after um, the murder up in the Bronx, and we had done the, uh, the, tr the uh, presentation with the United Bodegas of America at that time, and the news coverage was all over that we did recommend that people have panic buttons installed. So I, I think that a lot of people would go into a bodega or another small business and think that they might have that installed already. You mentioned a program um, where community officers are now reviewing the security and offering suggestions on, uh, to small business owners. How many businesses have partook or took advantage of this walkthrough? So in, in anticipation, in anticipation of this question, uh, I just pulled some numbers. Um, we have 1,699 security surveys uh, completed year to date by precinct crime prevention officers. But I just want to make a distinction that it's that's not just businesses; that could be residential uh, apartments or private homes as well. And um, last year we had a total of 2,393. Last year was? A total of 2,393. Which includes residential, multi-dwelling, uh, and small businesses. Yes, sir. We have over 12, over 10,000 bodegas alone in New York City. So I'm hoping that between the presentation that we did in December, um, ongoing discussion with the United Bodegas of America where we've offered this service, um, we, we're willing to go to anybody that's willing to have the service, and we're hoping you can get that word out for us as well. And I think perhaps when this bill is enacted and this pilot is um, set forth, offering these services to the bodegas, which really don't, can't afford another uh, expense. Mm -hmm. And rather than have no security system, they just don't have the means to, the wherewithal, mm -hmm. or a panic button, I would imagine that we would suggest or encourage the panic button over no system, no camera, no uh, security uh, system at all. We suggest everything that you can do that can safeguard your store from training employees, from us going in and speaking to your employees, from just taking simply something like taking down all the signs in the windows so that uh, passing patrols people on the street can actually see into the store and see if there's an issue. Uh, better lighting, better lighting outside. Um, when we did this presentation in December, uh, a lot of the store owners had cameras already. I asked them how many can actually see their cameras on devices. People were picking up their phones and showing me their stores right, right in their hands that they were looking into their stores. So, you know, there, there's a lot of people that are using technology, but it's, it's, it's not just technology. It's, it's observation, it's knowing your neighborhood coordination officers, um, getting to know the steady sectors in, in your area. We made sure that when we did this presentation again in December up in the Bronx, that we had the neighborhood coordination officers, as many as we could from uh, all the different neighborhoods come in. We had the crime prevention officers there from all of the different precincts to speak to people and tell them what they could do and make arrangements to come to their businesses as well. And I would imagine you also want to train them perhaps not to engage and risk their lives when it comes to a, a hold up or. Um, and that was very much part of the presentation that you know it, that you should not do that. That your your life and is worth so much more than anything possibly in the store. But for those brave owners or employees, like we witnessed this uh, for Junior, for example, where we actually saw the prop the business owner trying to hold on to and prevent Junior from being dragged out. Or more recently, during the summer on Allerton Avenue, where a bodega employee shielded and protected someone that ran in from protection for protection, um, was able to call 911. Are you familiar with that case? I'm not personally familiar, sir. Similar incident, young man ran in, was being 
after getting into a fight, ran in for safety, and they pursued him into the bodega. Mm -hmm. uh, the bodega employee successfully fought them off, protecting this individual. Mm -hmm. Now, in incidents like that, I would imagine cameras are great. Uh, it's a spur of the moment, and um, again, it's a, the bravery of an individual who risked them not knowing what the outcome can be. And we, uh, we have so many brave New Yorkers that have risked their lives uh, to s protect or save someone else, not only the men and women in blue, but New Yorkers uh, as a whole. Um, point being, a panic button. Thank God that instance didn't elevate to um, Junior's tragedy, but certainly notifying you immediately and having a response while fighting them off or defending uh, this young man could ha is something that we should be striving for. And I'm looking forward to working with you and the department and SBS as we come up with a comprehensive way um, to make sure all of our small businesses are afforded these protections, especially cash businesses. And I believe Jersey Maybe you may know a little bit more about this. Mandates gas stations to have such a panic button and security system in place. Because they're m often manned by one employee, mm -hmm. cash business, open 24-7, um, and off of beaten paths. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you should be looking at this as well. Um, Intro 1623 affords SBS and NYPD some discretion to identify locations for the pilot program. What do you think are the best factors to look at in determining where to locate the pilot districts? Um, if we were to go forward with this, I think we'd probably look at, uh, I guess there'd be a variety of factors, uh, including crime rates at the time, um, any legislation is passed um, neighborhood by neighborhood, crime rates would probably be the best factor. And then number of small businesses located, um, I think those are probably two things you would consider. Crime rates, small business, um, and maybe working with our community officers to determine uh, businesses that are open late hours in the day, off beaten paths that are in areas which are not well lit nor or um, with passerbys, is this something that we can come up with as a responsibility of our community officers? Um, you know, I mean, obviously our community officers know their community very well. Um, it would be difficult to compare, uh, for community officers to compare other neighborhoods by neighborhood. Um, we, I think we need some more comprehensive data than that um, in order to figure that out. But uh, you know our community officers are aware of those businesses in their community. But to compare it to other communities would be a, a more of a challenge. Um, but we can figure out you know, if this you know goes through and figure out ways to identify areas or businesses. Or businesses. I, I think you'd also have to find out how many businesses have alarms now already. You know they may already have this in place. They may have an alarm system with a panic button or an alarm system without a panic button that's already monitored by a central station where they could just uh, add something like a, a panic alarm. Uh, and looking, I'm hopeful this hearing, um, as we make public the option and this consideration will be received with enthusiasm and embraced and perhaps help shape a safer city for us all as we strive um, to protect our communities and our business owners. Does SBS have a statement they want to make? No, Chairman, not currently. I'm so disappointed you. I was so looking forward to <laughs> SBS explaining why they would embrace this program and how important of a fabric it would be to protecting businesses that continue to thrive. But I'll ask you a question. What can SBS do to better engage bodegas specifically in relations to safety? Um, thank you for the question, Chairman. So we work very closely with NYPD and um, our other city agency partners to um, learn from um, 
not just bodegas, but also you know any small business throughout the city about what concerns they have. And we work through either our um, suite of services to help um, alleviate those concerns, or we work with our agency partners. Um, in this case, we would work very closely. We'll continue to work very closely with NYPD to figure out what's the most comprehensive way to help um, with security measures for small businesses. And I would imagine you agree any uh, financial assistance that we can give so our small businesses don't have to make the decision of whether they meet payroll or uh, upgrade or have a security system is in our best interest? interest? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think we, we s like NYPD, we support like the intent of the legislation and, you know, we want to learn more about what's happening and see how we can best be helpful. Good. Being helpful would mean allocating and helping get the word out and giving the resources um, that's needed to reach out to all businesses. How would you envision a plan? How would you get the word out that this is another offering that you can do working in cooperation with NYPD for a safety risk assessment um, and this pilot? Well, we have um, various um, tools in our in our um, within our agency where we go. Um, as you as you're aware, we've gone out with you as well door to door with small businesses, um, <laughs> and we've um, we've done this with other agencies as well. We've partnered with other agencies to speak specifically about how those agencies can be helpful to small businesses, and we'd love to um, you know continue doing that with the NYPD and um, work with them to go. Um, along these corridors and speak to small businesses about the services that NYPD has to offer in this area. I'm curious, would you believe it's more effective as a reimbursable program or as a program that's standalone during the installation uh, where the businesses uh, could just benefit directly without having to dig into their own pockets? Um, I mean, I, I can't speak specifically to the, the you know, what would work best for a business in ideal owner. In, a, in an ideal scenario? I mean, ideally for us, like, you know, however we can be helpful to small businesses um, is what we generally try to do. If, if, they, if they have issues with, um, with costs, um, you know, we work with them to figure out how to best, um, you know, alleviate those concerns. But um, we'd have to really work um, specifically with the business and with our agency partners to figure out what works best for them. Right. So affordability, educating them first of all that this is Absolutely. in their best interest and uh, something that the city is willing to um, work on alongside of our business owners in the best interest of their safety and community absolutely Thank you for your time, and we look forward to uh, continuing this. Could I add something? To that? Certainly. I think one of the things that we overlooked was explaining that part of the statement, what we're really talking about, is that when you have an alarm system like this, we're recommending you have the central station, the cost is not normally the installation of the alarm, it's the ongoing payment for the central station. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that was part of what we just wanted to identify here. And that's why we're looking to shape this bill into something that's comprehensive. Mo my understanding is some of these major uh, alarm installers will do the installation for free, and it's the monthly payment uh, that they're able to provide those for the installation for free. So you're absolutely right. And it, the way it works, as we all know, is if their alarm is triggered, they make a phone call. If there's no answer, automatically, uh, they, call, they notify the proper authorities, and if there is a phone that was mistakenly done in error, um, there is a code that's given, um, and in some cases there is a code that's given to identify that, yes, there's a real problem uh, without letting the um, individuals know that they're actually claim that they're informing this provider that there is an emergency uh, situation by giving a uh, anything but the actual code word. It, but in some cases, in some alarms, if it's a hold-up alarm, they won't call. They'll they'll make the notification to the police first because of the sensitive nature and because they don't want somebody getting hurt in that situation. What would you rather see here? A direct call then to uh, once triggered to law enforcement or to the 
store to confirm whether or not it was a false alarm? I think that the industry standard is if it's a hold up type alarm that, that they don't call the store. Um, but then again, as I said before, if you have uh, cameras, for instance, where you have a central station that also can see your cameras and they can actually see what's going on, that of course is so much more helpful. I, I'm not sure we're ready for complete government oversight of looking into our cameras when an alarm goes off. Um, not the government, the central well, station, private private central station. Well, well, that would be another step, right? You're looking to bypass all of that and maybe the technology will exist someday where you hit that button and all of a sudden it'll operate like your Argus camera that there's a central station within the NYPD that's monitoring and can identify and um, let law enforcement know exactly what's going on. I'm not sure we're there yet and uh, for obvious concerns, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we call up uh, Sabrine Ofman and Fernando Mateo? No particular order, just please announce yourself and if you represent the organization. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Fernando Mateo. I am the spokesman for the United Bodegas of America. Council member, how are you? Good to see you again, Fernando. Likewise. You have a statement? Sure. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, focusing on this particular issue. I think we all lived a tragedy of a young man that uh, we all feel. And um, it's very easy to just let time go by and forget about what happened. Doing something takes a lot of courage, and I can commend you for this. Uh, we have spoken, and we have a very close relationship with Leandra Felix, uh, Junior's mother. Uh, I was with her last week, and I've been with her for the last few weeks, maybe once or twice a month. Uh, discussing what can we do better to prevent uh, another junior tragedy in the city. And it's very, um, it, it's very, what she feels is very different from what we all feel because she lost a son. And she basically has said to us, what you guys are doing at the United Bodegas of America could have saved my son's life. He says, my son could have been here if we would have put in place all of the things that you're doing now. But like everything else um, in government, you wait to get robbed before you buy the lock, okay? So once again, uh, council member, I really appreciate you focusing on, on this particular issue. We all know that bodega owners work a lot of hours. They work sometimes 18 hours a day is a normal day for them. And they are community centers, aside from being bodegas, uh, serving, you know, eggs, beer, uh, milk, bread, whatever they sell. Safe Haven Bodegas is a smart bodega. We want to have smart bodegas like you have smart homes. We have the technology available today to do all of the things that you have said can be done. It's always very easy to say, but, but, you know, it can, you can do it this way, you can do it that way. You know what, if we have the technology, let's just get it done. That's the way it, it should be. A smart bodega to us is not only a panic button. A panic button is just one of the many components, but it's a very key component. 
NYPD and uh, Inspector Corey, oh, by the way, I'm very grateful to her because she has spent a lot of time with us, educating us, teaching us, explaining to us what NYPD needs or would like to, to see to better protect us. The city of New York, when you own a small business like a club or a place that has events, they always recommend that you have one security for every 50 people in, in, the, in the place. The city of New York has 8 million um, people that live here. And we have, I think, 40,000 police officers, 45,000 police officers. That's a lot less. That's one third of what the city requires from us, the small business people. And that's not counting the tourists that come to the city. So I, I personally believe that Public safety is not an NYPD, it is an NYPD responsibility, but it's not solely, we can't solely hold them responsible. We have to do more. And I think that engaging with small businesses would elevate the number uh, so that the city can be a lot safer than what it is. Having a panic button, as you said, is crucial because a lot of the times you're seeing something, but you can't pick up a phone to make a call and say this is happening but you can easily press a button, and that, can, that message could reach the local precinct either through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or whatever technology is out there. We have a technology expert that has worked with us, and um, he has installed a series of things in, in bodegas, and they have worked. In fact, after Junior's attack, as you said, on Allerton Avenue, it's happened on many different avenues in the Bronx where a bodega owner comes out with a bat or a, a piece of steel or something to defend someone that ran in there away from a gang. And they have saved a few lives, but they've put their lives at risk. How do you, in a moment of panic, pick up a phone and try to explain to 911, because they ask you a lot of questions. Where are you? What time is it? Uh, what's the exact, what does the perp look like? I mean, how do you answer all of this when you've got a gun or bullets flying? It's very easy when you press a button and you know that it's an emergency, it can, they can dispatch a patrol car to the scene. So you know what, stick to your guns, insist on that this is necessary. If we had every bodega in New York with a panic button and other devices that will help them, you know, this could be a huge tool for NYPD because now you've increased their force from 45,000 to 65 or 75,000. And if other small businesses had different technology that can also help the cops, it's like we would be working together, dispatching the cops where they really need to be. Sometimes they're in places that they don't need to be. They need to be where the crimes are being committed. And it's very difficult to do that um, if, if they're counting on us picking up a phone to call. Yes, there are different ways of doing it. And yes, uh, bodegas owners have uh, insurance companies that could monitor and could, in essence, answer that, that panic button and call the cops for them. But if it went to the local precinct, it'd be that much faster. You know, things happen quickly. Junior got killed in minutes. You know, it, it doesn't take hours or, you know, it takes seconds to kill somebody. It takes seconds for you to be able to react. You know, so having a panic button is important. And it's what I say. It's not just having it under the counter in one spot. It's having it around your chest in a button so that if you're in the back of the store and you see that, you know, your boss has a gun to his head, you don't, you just press the button while you're back there and nobody knows that you've alerted the cops. See? So what you're, what you're doing is, is, is just amazing. Um, if you don't mind, sure. you're very passionate on this and you've been involved from the very beginning and not just since the tragedy and the brutal murder of Junior, but for years you've been advocating for the bodegas and the, uh, the positive impact that they have, not only for the community, but for our immigrant community that is looking to elevate themselves to success and live that American dream. I want to focus a little bit because over a year now I've been working on this bill. It took me a long time 
to get this bill to where it is today. It took Junior's death to get this bill even on the table. Because you, you uh, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, that government is often reactive and not proactive. We wait for something to happen before we try to figure out how to address it and prevent it from rea uh, reoccurring. One of the stigmas, because this Junior's death um, impacted the country, the world that this could happen uh, on our streets in such a brutal fashion by uh, a group of young men. One of the issues that came about was the quick response to label the bodega owner as unresponsive initially, if you remember the outcry and uh, which ultimately led to the closure of that business and the family that owned that bodega feared for their own life as they were receiving threats. The children had to be removed from the school. The family was, think, I'm not sure if they relocated from their uh, home that was nearby the bodega. All because someone decided to show a clipping that wasn't a full picture of what had occurred. Do you recall that? Of course I do. That unfortunate misrepresentation of what actually transpired, and it took that bodega owner so much strength to stand up and clarify when media refused to actually show that himself, he put himself in danger trying to protect that young man as he tried to jump over the counter. Uh, I know they kept repeating that footage of him pushing the young man out, not knowing what had happened, he just ran in and tried to jump behind the counter. And I just felt that it was important that we bring that up because I know those bodega owners. I know what role they play and how vital they are to our neighborhoods and our residents. They not only offer credit at a time when residents can't perhaps purchase uh, their supplies there, but often when a child gets locked out of a home it's go to the bodega, I'll be there. You lost your keys, go to bodega. You need to call mom and dad, where do you go? The bodega. When a senior feels threatened, where does he go? The bodega. Or if there's an attack on a woman, where does she run into? The bodega. Looking for that safety. So they are safe havens, and they've been so for decades. And it's tragic that their value only comes after a tragedy. I apologize for the interruption, but I wanted to know, wanted to bring on record the value that our bodegas bring to our neighborhoods and the role that they play in making sure that our communities take advantage of the safe haven that they really are. And to speak up a bit on that, uh, bodega owner um, and his bravery as he actually tried to fight off and protect that young man. It, it very few people, as you said, you know, a short clip basically um, condemned this bodega owner. And in essence, uh, he was fearing for his life just as much as Junior was fearing for his life. Um, I also want to mention here, we have the president of the United Bodegas of America, Radames Rodriguez here as well as board members of the organization and our technology um, a consultant here as well. Uh, they took this very personal because they knew that bodega owner. That bodega owner lost his bodega. Uh, Junior lost his life. That bodega owner lost his bodega, which is his, in, his entire life savings and wound up in debt. Um, I invited any and every council member to be a bodega owner, a bodega clerk for one day. You know how many responses I got? None. Some said, well, I will, but let me know. Let me. You know what? You can only know what a bodega owner does if you sit behind that counter. As you said, you are everything to that community. You're basically not just selling them product. A bodega, bodegas are known for giving credit all week 
and waiting for that person to collect their paycheck to then pay them at the end of the week. Bodegas hold children when parents are running late to go to school, I mean, to, from work. They say, wait for me at the bodega. Don't move from there. I'll, and the bodega on and out becomes a daycare center. You know, bodega becomes a consultant. They deal with people going in there trying to rob them, kill them, assault them, <laughs> steal their products, and they, there's very little that they can do. But one thing that they do get a lot is an unfriendly city, a city that doesn't treasure the most valuable people that they have, which are the risk takers, which are the guys that work 18 hours, which are the guys that you know go in there and, and bust their ass, excusing the language, 18 hours a day. They're not appreciated in this city. Small businesses have become the target of the city of New York, and it's the most unfriendly business place that you could ever want to do business. So you know what? When you take a stand as a council member to try to help and bring funds in to protect them, their community, their children, and everyone that goes into a bodega, we have to salute you because no one else has done it. We've done it on our own. These guys, that tech guy there gives them credit so that they can install all of the things that you're saying, you know what? Let's give back to these people. You have billions of dollars in resources that this city has. It's never given back to small businesses. It's offered to Amazon. It's offered to Google. In the billions, because they're going to hire 25,000 people. Guess what? The 20,000 bodegas in this city employ over, over, they employ hundreds of thousands of people. And for those hundreds of thousands of people to lose their job, you know what that's going to take? It's going to take a lot of bodega closing down. Amazon picks up and they leave with 25,000 do jobs tomorrow, like J.P. Morgan is planning on doing and moving to Texas. Why? Because this city doesn't appreciate the hardworking men and women. All they do is have agencies that target these small businesses, go after them to try to put them out of business, which we don't understand. Mr. Mateo, I uh, welcome that fresh breath of air, and I could certainly use your... Uh, passion on this council because I couldn't agree with you more. The, the asset, and I just want to talk a little bit about bodegas, what you, the challenges that you have to overcome on a daily basis from consumer behavior changes, big box store competition that you possibly can't compete with pricing. Uh, with the new tech bodegas that are coming out with no clerks, no employees. <laughs> you know what I mean? And at the same time, in a city which benefits from your business, where not only the valuable tax base that you are, because you pay, you collect sales tax for the city, you employ uh, New Yorkers, you're paying a slew of taxes. On top of that, we overregulate you, and we wait to catch you. It's a gotcha scenario, and we bombard you with uh, oversight, fees and fines, instead of rewarding you. Hang on. For you know, I got to give, I got to give you a round of applause. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, you're absolutely right. So I'm. Even though what Tati was going on is how we have a power, um, our way of solving things. I think we should bring it. You, you should, you should, you should have the SBA. We're getting. Go, go into a bodega and become a bodega owner for one day, so I, that they I, know what it is. The. Uh, you know? My benefit is that I come out of small business world. Unfortunately, many of my uh, colleagues and people in government have never worked in the private sector. They have no idea what it means. They've never held a job. I won't say that. Oh. But uh, they've never worked in a private sector to understand how difficult it is for our mom, in particular, our micro businesses to survive. If there's no, there's no business that day. It's not like wine where it gets better. A day lost in business is a day that you could never remake. It's not that you're going to recoup those losses. And when you, and those are the things that are not in your control. But the things that are in your control are when this city makes a decision without your input or against your input to impose clear curbs no parking, no stopping, no standing from the hours of 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. or from 3 to 7. 
making it virtually impossible for you to keep your doors open. Or when they enforce an outdated law, such as signage, that began with fines as low as 5,000 and as high as 20,000. Or when we pass legislation that it's impossible for you to know because there's 6,000 rules and regulations that our small businesses have to comply with. Guess what? They're not in your language. They're not easy to find transparent. Our owners, our small business operators want to comply. The only way they find out that they're in violation is when there's a pink ticket that says pay. You're not afforded that opportunity and we need to strive and do better to make sure that the city of New York is not another burden on whether or not you survive. So I thank you for the work that you're doing. I'm not sure if you want to close it up with anything yet. Yeah, I'd like to just close it up by saying, as, um, as chairman of this, uh, of the small business uh, for the city, um, I would urge you to uh, ask the city to budget a billion dollars to give back and help small businesses that pay billions in taxes and stop offering it to these mega companies that don't need it. I think that if you came out and you said, you know what, I want a billion dollars to give back to the small businesses that have taken risks and that have paid us billions of dollars in fines and that we continue to castigate them for no good reason, rather than rewarding them, we punish them with fines and enforcement and all kinds of things that just don't make sense, okay? I want a billion dollars to be able to give back to these small businesses. I think that, you know what, we would all get on our hand, on our feet, and we would, and we would applaud you because no one's ever done that. We're, we're the forgotten few that run this city. We are the backbone of this city. You know, restaurants, bodega owners, cab drivers, um, small businesses in general, we are the people that hire people, you know. Today you have so many empty storefronts. You know why? Because this city has become so unfriendly and so politically correct. They, you know, you can't be politically correct and be honest. When you're politically correct, you're dishonest. Are you running for office? You know? No, I'm not running for office. And I'll tell you one thing. I, I, I want to I respond to you. Sure. In my years of in the private sector and now as an elected official, each time a government agency or an elected official approached a business and asked, how can we be helpful? They hurt that business. So along your lines, I would encourage changing just one part of your argument. Sure. Tell government, stop trying to help, because each time you do, it hurts more. We've never asked them for help. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> they, okay. they always get involved. You know, they think that they, they run you, they own your business. And through their agencies, you know what? They have so much power that they can take away what your, your whole life savings with the snap of a finger. And all these agencies like SBS and the health department and consumer affairs, you would think that they are there to encourage people to come into the city and do business. What they're doing is destroying the fabric of the city and the small businesses, the small investors that want to start a business. So listen, thank you very much. I've got to run up to the Bronx now to the Department of Buildings to deal with some other issues for some uh, bodega owners that are up there struggling to stay open. Before you leave, Mateo, sure. maybe you want to hear this young lady's sure. uh, testimony because she also represents a major stakeholder in our small businesses and Absolutely. perhaps there's more in common there that you can work on. Sabrine, will you? Hello, uh, I'm Sabrine Offman. I'm the advocacy director for Yemeni, the Yemeni American Merchant Association. Um, the Yemeni American Merchant Association is a nonprofit that was established after the very successful bodega strike in 2017 against the Muslim ban. We at, oh, not, sorry, okay, sorry. We, 
We at the we at the at, we at Yama are pleased to provide testimony on behalf of our 3,000 merchants on Intro 1623. We would like to thank Council Member Jonaj and all the and the rest of the committee involved. Um, Yama, as an organi organization, is dedicated to elevating, educating, and advocating for Yemeni American merchants to protect bodega owners and workers. We would like to ask that City Council uh, to examine if this panic button. In, business, in small businesses is an effective route in fighting, sm uh, in fighting violence and crime, especially in vulnerable communities of color. Merchants and customers, and customers have been equally impacted by violence for decades. On December 12, 2017, Abdullah Yafi, a Yemeni American de deli clerk, was shot in the chest and killed after having a dispute with a customer. We have also seen some cases where customers are targets of violence. On June 20th, 2018, Lissandro Guzman Feliz Jr. Jr. was attacked by gang members in a, inside a bodega. After the store owner was pressured into giving Jr. away to the gang, the innocent teen was dragged outside and murdered. This incident happened close to St. Barnabas Hospital and in the presence of two police officers who stood there confused as Jr. was bleeding out. This past week, we polled a number of our bodega owners and found that many are interested in the panic button to support the bill. We would like to, to support the bill, we would like to the council to take the following conditions into consideration. Thoroughly assess this plan in the backdrop of police brutality and violence. We are concerned with how this will pay, play out in, in, in New York City communities of color. We want the city council to research if, the, if other cities have used a panic button to determine if this is an effective route to even consider in New York City. We want the NYPD to respond to calls made by Yama members immediately in incidents of threat. Our members have reported that NYPD shows, shows, up, two hour, uh, shows up an hour or two after the call. We would like the city council to support the Bronx Peace Builders Program, bringing bro bodega owners, community, faith leaders, um, former gang members and the general uh, community for monthly gatherings to break bread and build trust to defuse disputes and reduce crimes in neighborhood, uh, in neighborhood bodegas. I want to thank you. We've been joined by Council Member Rosenthal, and I'm not sure if you have any questions. I, I mean, thank you, Chair. Um, I just really want to thank you for your testimony. Um, you're raising such important points that um, if if bodega owners are, if the, if the people you surveyed are calling 911 now and it takes two hours for the NYPD to respond, um, it's worth investigating why is that happening and would a panic button change that outcome? So thank you for that. What is from your experience in talking with your members, what are their concerns? Um, well, <clears throat> many concerns are, well, obviously they're concerned for their safety, safety, but they're also concerned for other members of the community, especially mem uh, members of the community that are also of color and their, uh, um, their vulnerability to uh, police brutality and, and things that happen happened in the past. Yes, I share those concerns, but I'm trying to play out in my mind a specific example. So the notion that somebody comes into a bodega, does something mm -hmm. untoward, somebody presses a button, mm -hmm. I understand the concern of are you going to get there fast enough mm -hmm. because we want to protect the bodega owner in that situation. Um, and if the NYPD is not coming, that's no protection for them. So what assurance do we have? But is the concern that in another, a different situation, that the police might overreact? Yes. Um, that is something we, we are... We and I'm, I'm interested in that, and how do we juggle that and address right. that? Because that's a valid concern in my book. Yes, we want we want the city council to consider um, vulnerable communities of color and their their reaction and their uh, experiences with the with the police. Um, into we want them to take that in consideration and study, um, like whether a police let's say you know uh, something were to happen, police show up and overreact 
in a situation where, you know, someone innocent is killed or, you know, attacked unjustly. That's something we also want to keep in consideration. So some sort of training component, yes. perhaps, yeah. on many ways the things we're always calling for, mm-hmm. de-escalation, um, respect. Um, you know, how to sort out a situation so that the overreaction doesn't occur. Yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank, thank you, you for your Council testimony. Member. Thank you. I want to thank you for your testimony and your time. Thank you. Thank you. We have Ed Kashecki and Alan Glasser. Your next panel. In no particular order. Thank you. Good, good morning. Does this work? That works? Yes. Okay. Shall we? You want to give that to the court officer? Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Edward Kashecki. I am retired from the NYPD. Uh, I've been in the alarm industry since 1981. I'm the past president of the New York Fire Alarm Association, currently on the executive board of the association. Uh, as a former responding police officer, I have extensive experience in response to alarms. I also have extensive experience in the installation, service, and monitoring of security systems, as well as all new technologies. I'm currently one of the owners of Statewide Monitoring and Statewide Fire Corp, an alarm monitoring facility based in New York City. We currently monitor thousands of burglar alarms, panic alarms, hold up alarms in commercial premises, such as banks and stores, and fire alarms throughout the metropolitan area, both residential and commercial. We are also the backup monitoring facility for the New York City uh, Department of Education's burglar alarms. We also monitor fire alarms for every New York City school. We also monitor all types of systems for many of the city's major facilities, hospitals, colleges, city, and federal buildings. I'd like to offer several considerations which may or may not have been discussed prior to this meeting, but are not addressed in the amendment as written. Regarding the budget, uh, would this be an allotment per store? Uh, Would the budget include only the installation of a system, or would the first year of professional license monitoring be included as well? Uh, If not, would the budget only include installation? Would the business owner be responsible for payment of the monitoring service? Uh, Licensed security company professionals are usually the best for advising which type of panic devices to install. There are many different devices. When where to install them in line with business practices of the store owner. Standard methods of alarm transmission are phone line, internet, and or radio communications. Each premise will be required to provide either a phone line, internet line, or a radio communicator, which could be used as, uh, well, the alarm company obviously would provide the radio communicator, which could be used as a method of transmission. Several UL monitoring centers, such as ours, have the capability to view and or listen upon receipt of an alarm. 
The additional cost is not exorbitant and would permit the monitoring center to actually view the premise and or listen in upon receipt of an alarm. This would aid in the police response. One panic device on site sends a panic signal. The NYPD will not know if they're responding to an arm holdup in progress, a verbal dispute with the store owner, or an incident where a shoplifter ran out of the store with an item minutes ago. Proper training of business owners and employees as to when to use the panic device is key to a successful program such as this. Every individual incident which may lead to use of a panic button by the owner or employees is situational and unique, both to the store owner and to the first responders. I would caution the council regarding two items in the amendment. The first would be the use of a panic button by a patron. Uh, I noted that that's in uh, the amendment. Patrons should probably not even be aware of panic devices located in the store. The second one uh, would be the use of audiovisual devices. I know that the police department inspector uh, brought up uh, audible, uh, audible situations. Um, in the past, I've been involved in enrolling store owners for the same type of program several years ago. It was decided to use only a visual device outside the store in the event a panic button was pressed. This served two purposes. It would alert a passing radio car and it would enhance the response. It was decided not to use an audio device since during a holdup, it may induce a criminal to um, take immediate injurious action to the store owner or employee, which he otherwise may not have taken. Uh, in closing, I, um, I was also uh, going back to my days in the police department. I spent years uh, in the bedford stuyvesant in Fort Greene area, uh, working plain clothes. Uh, I spent many years uh, doing undercover work, uh, decoy work, uh, plain clothes anti-crime work for about seven years. Um, and, and I obviously have uh, a lot of uh, experience responding to these things. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank the council members for their time and effort to put forth this program. Additionally, feel free to contact me personally anytime with any questions or to meet for any further discussions. My cell number is below. Further, I would like to take this opportunity to invite any council members, any members of the NYPD, and any members of the Bo uh, Bodega Association who may be interested to visit our monitoring facility where we can perform a demonstration of the various panic devices, show how the signals are received, processed, and handled. All right, and that's the bulk of my uh, statement, I guess. I want to thank you, Mr. Koshecki, and the reason we have these hearings is so we have a better understanding and we, the committee will then work to I've testified the before best approach. The hearings, so we're yeah. grateful to you for uh -huh. your testimony yeah. and your expertise uh, has added value mm -hmm. to this hearing. Thank you. But there is no, you, you made a mention here uh -huh. that the um, patrons mm -hmm. are involved in this panic button. I believe in the amendment, it, it indicates uh, employees or patrons. I don't think so. The intent is for the use of employee or patron case of emergency. You're right. And we're looking into that. Yeah, I think patrons should be probably more. Sir? My name is Alan Glasser. I'm the executive director of the Metropolitan Burglar and Fire Alarm Association. I thank you for inviting me to speak in front of the council. There is a handout, and um, I would like to direct you to uh, page three as I read along. Um, I'm here representing our members, uh, which are both small businesses and large businesses here in the city of New York, who are properly, properly licensed as per New York State Department of State um, in order to install burglar alarms, fire alarms, access control, and CCTV, there is a state license which the city of New York abides by and, and recognizes. So um, I'm here to, uh, paragraph number two, uh, to make clear to the Committee on Small Business Services that, but not limited to, uh, A, panic alarms, hold-up buttons, associated audible visual signaling, video imaging, burglar alarms are required by law to be sold, installed, serviced, maintained by properly licensed businesses. And again, that's a state license. Um, so paragraph B, all equipment used shall either be UL listed or nationally, uh, uh, or other nationally recognized testing agency for its purpose. Uh, so paragraph C, proper wiring and wiring protection where required. Subparagraph so D, panic alarms shall be monitored by a UL listed 
an FDNY New York City approved central station. There may be a question why I put in FDNY. In the city of New York, fire alarms are required to be monitored by central stations that are inspected and approved by the fire department in the city of New York. I put that in there since we are dealing with New York City um, businesses. Let's keep uh, those businesses monitored by city approved companies that have been inspected by the fire department. It's the only agency in the city of New York that does inspect our central stations. Uh, Subparagraph so E, MBFAA support and voluntary technical expertise. Um, and I had to throw in limited and subject to the association attorney's approval. And um, paragraph three, support the New York City Police Department's view and issues concerning this bill. And um, paragraph four, support the Bodega Association of the United States which I support monetarily going out two o'clock in the morning and getting ice cream. So <laughs> they are very dear to me. <laughs> um, this, is, um, this is an opportunity for our member companies to support the efforts of the city, uh, New York City uh, Council, the Committee on Small Business Services, the New York City Police Department, the Bodega Association, as well as many other small businesses around New York City to help stem the threat of crime such as robberies and holdups using proven and reliable electronic security technology. And again, I thank the committee for having myself and Ed Koshecki and others as witnesses. I want to thank you and uh, Council Member Rosenthal has a question or a statement to make. I do, a little <laughs> bit of both. Um, so thank you for coming to testimony. You're coming to testify your testimony is very thank compelling. I, I, um, I think when we think about how best to protect um, the, the bodega owners and, and small businesses, you know, there was something that I think is citywide, and you probably have it in your district, council member, um, where small businesses can get these little stickers that say safe haven, and it's a message to the community, come in here and you'll be safe. And, um, I wonder if it would be possible to add language to the bill to require that when the panic button is installed, that there be some sort of required uh, relationship building with the NYPD so that when you get your panic button installed, you get some sort of sticker on the door and a, a uh, not requirement, but some sort of relationship with the local NCOs. So they start visiting the bodega on a regular basis, getting to know those workers. And we were just talking about with Yama that perhaps that could reduce the possibility of um, inappropriate escalation of um, um, uh, violence at the bodega itself. That if the NCOs really knew these bodega owners, the workers, by dropping by on a regular basis, that everyone sees this as part of the community, that perhaps that would be a way of making sure that any bodega owner that's worried about violence against them or, or something more in the store, um, that that having a requiring a better relationship with the NCOs might address that. Friendly, friendly suggestion. I think that's a great point. And just so you know, prior to me uh, running for office, some 12 years ago, we began a pilot program with the community council, the local precinct, on such a poster. And it was a large poster. Mm. And it was a safe haven advising children and residents and passerbys that in the event of uh, an emergency that they should feel free to enter that uh, establishment and seek seek shelter or aid. Uh, and you're right, mm -hmm. it, and, it, and would help build that force the relationship between an SEO officer and a local um, small business owner, ethnicity, a group, uh, and better understand one another and uh, help shape the city. 
I really appreciate your saying that. And um, I'm not signed on yet, but I would like very much to sign on. So let's, you know, if you could stay in touch or if the council could stay in touch with my office and keep me apprised of how we can tweak it. Thank you thank very you, much. Thank you, council member. I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank you. This hearing is now ended.